So let's try a problem. Let's say that we're taking a six kilogram object and dropping it six meters from rest. Now let's try to make our numbers different. Well, five kilogram object. And dropping it six meters from rest. And the question is, how fast will this be going when it hits the ground? All right. Um, so now we're going to see how we can use this equation to solve this type of problem. We're starting with a really simple problem, but we want to be uh, systematic, so let me give you a handout that's got the systematic approach here. So the thing that we want to look at is how to use net work by the non-conservative forces equals the change in mechanical energy. Yeah, so that's the big one over here. Uh, there we go. Step one, identify and label the initial and final points of the interval we're considering. Well, here's the initial point. Oops. Remember, we're trying to figure out the final velocity when we hit the ground. Here's something that uh, we, it's too bad we didn't have time to talk about before. Um, are we going to be focusing on the velocity the instant before we hit the ground or the instant after we hit the ground? Yeah. A lot of people look at this and say, well, duh, when it hits the ground, the velocity will be zero, right? Uh, that messes people up a lot on kinematics problems. Oftentimes, people, they'll see a kinematics problem that says, what's going to be the velocity when it hits the ground? And they say, well, gee, I didn't need to take physics to do that. I know that when it hits the ground, the velocity is zero. Well, what the problem really means is the velocity the instant before we hit the ground. Well, at that point, the velocity isn't zero. In fact, it's moving very quickly at that point. So uh, the final velocity here, we need to keep in mind this is the instant before we hit the ground, just like for a uh, kinematics problem. Step two, identify all the forces on the object. What are the forces on this object? Um, gravity. Yeah, which we call the weight. The weight is the gravitational force of the Earth on the object. Um, are there any other forces on this object? Based on how I described the problem. No. no. Remember that you should, how do you identify the forces? Well, everything has a weight, and then all the other forces come from things that are touching the object. But there's nothing else touching this object besides the air, and we always ignore air resistance. So the weight is the only force here. All right, now we need to separate these into conservative and non-conservative forces. Well, have we learned is the weight conservative or non-conservative? Conservative. Conservative. Remember that this semester, you're only going to see two conservative forces, the weight and the spring force. She just memorized the only conservative forces this semester are weight and the spring force. How can you remember that? Remember that it's the conservative forces that have potential energies. Well, did we learn about a gravitational potential energy? Yes, so this must be a conservative force. Otherwise, it wouldn't have a potential energy. For example, I'm never going to teach you about the frictional potential energy, because friction is non-conservative, and it doesn't have a potential energy. OK, so uh, this is uh, work, uh, conservative forces. All right, step three, identify the work done by all the non-conservative forces and plug them into this equation. Remember, this is the general equation we're going to be using here. So we want to identify the work done by the non-conservative forces and plug that in. So what number should I plug in on the left-hand side of this equation in this case? What will, be, what will be the work done by the non-conservative forces in this case? Yeah, so what would be a good number to plug in here for the work done by the Yeah. Oftentimes people get messed up when, they, when something doesn't exist. But remember, mathematicians aren't phased when something doesn't exist. They just plug in the number zero for that. So in this case, there is no work done by non-conservative forces because there are no non-conservative forces. Weight is conservative, so it does not get included in this side of the equation here. So we would leave that out. So we get this equation. What does this tell us about the mechanical energy? What does it mean if something isn't changing? Well, if something's not changing, that just means it's constant, right? In fact, what that tells us is that, in this case, the mechanical energy will be conserved. You're going to be doing a lot of problems here that involve conservation of energy. 
What does the word conserved mean? Conserved is just a fancy term for constant or not changing. If something is conserved, that just means that it's constant or not changing. But we just saw that in this case, the mechanical energy will be conserved or not changing. You can see why this is called a conservative force, because it conserves mechanical energy. If the only force is the weight, then the mechanical energy would be conserved. If there was friction, a non-conservative force, then the mechanical energy would not be conserved. That's why friction is considered non-conservative. The conservative forces are the ones that conserve mechanical energy, and the non-conservative ones are the ones that don't. So what's the relationship now between the initial mechanical energy and the final mechanical energy? So this would be a new good way to write this equation. We can just say now that the initial and final mechanical energies are the same. That's what it means for the energy to be conserved. Okay. So. Um, there we go, and now we're ready uh, for step four. Now notice that step four has two sides, the left side and the right side, because um, there's two different approaches. There's an approach when energy is conserved and when energy is not conserved. Um, well, in this case, the mechanical energy is being conserved, so we should use the right-hand column, the case in the right-hand column for step four when the energy is conserved. So we're using this key equation. Well, what are the parts of mechanical energy? Well, remember that there's the initial kinetic energy and the initial potential energy. And what should I write on the right-hand side of this equation? The final kinetic energy and the final potential energy. Now we're ready to go on to step five. We need to start plugging things in for these terms, plugging things in for the energies. Uh, well, any ideas what the initial kinetic energy would be or how we could figure it out? Good. That was hidden information. If we're dropped from rest, we initially have no kinetic energy. Because remember that kinetic energy is the energy of your motion. One half mv squared. If v is zero, this would be zero. Good. So that would be a zero. What should we plug in for the initial potential energy? Um, isn't it like weight times height times gravity? That's right. MGH. So let's go ahead and calculate that. Take out your calculators and use that. Remember that G stands for the acceleration due to gravity. Remember, when you see an italics G in the textbook, does that stand for a signed number or an unsigned number? Isn't it negative 9.8? Well, when you see an italics G in your textbook, that actually just stands for the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity. That's important when you're looking at the formulas in your textbook. Um, it's true, um, after all, whether this is positive or negative depends on what your positive direction is, right? Um, if, you chose, uh, if you chose down to be your positive direction, then this would be positive 9.8. So um, in your textbook, when you see a G, that just means the magnitude. Um, but maybe to make that clearer, I should have put a dot when I wrote down this formula. That's why I like to use dots to indicate magnitudes, because otherwise it's hard to look at a formula and tell whether you're supposed to put the sign in or not. OK, so here we're supposed to put in just the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity. Uh, what answer did you get for that? Good. What would be the units on that? Joules. Good. I'm glad that you remembered that. So what are the units for kinetic energy? Joules. What are the units for work? Joules. What are the units for potential energy? Joules. The units for any type of work or any type of energy are joules. By the way, it looks like we were assuming 
that we're going to choose the ground here as a height of zero. That would obviously be the simplest thing to do. We're assuming that this would be at a height of zero. And we can write that down. All right, so that's our initial potential energy. Okay, what should I write down for KF? We know that the formula for energy is 1 half mv squared, but we know what the mass is. That's 5. Since everything is standard units here, we don't actually have to plug the units into the formula. In fact, it'll be more confusing than it's worth to plug the units in. Uh, but by the way, you do need to work with SI units when you're working with this equation. So if you have something in grams or uh, something that's not in SI units, you have to convert it. Otherwise, uh, you won't be able to, to work with joules. So this does have to be an SI unit. So you'll probably have to do that on the homework. Okay. 